is it's never a straight path, unfortunately, and there are many challenges along the way. And of course, we're going to make sure we talk about how we can overcome those hurdles. OK, um, and, and that's really what this session will be about. OK, now, please be aware that before the webinar, some of our community did submit questions. So we have, where possible, included coverage of those questions uh, throughout the conversation. And as I say, some of those will also get covered at the end of the session. So let's get into the good stuff now. So research has been carried out by Applied which shows that there were still less women compared to men applying for roles in tech. Now, that might not be a surprise for us, but that also suggests that gender diversity at the initial sourcing stage is significant and it matters. And according to one study, when there's just one woman in the finalist pool, their chances of being hired are statistically zero. So let's take this out and put it out to the panel. You know, what do you think the main barriers with hiring at the moment are? And maybe we could start with the applied um, panelists. Yeah, perfect. So the, the issue that we've got at the moment um, is obviously that a lot more, a lot less women are applying for tech roles than men. I think it's something like 20 percent uh, less than men will apply. And then once uh, they've actually seen the job adverts, there's like 16 percent are less likely to apply for the job actually after reviewing it. But the really interesting thing is that men and women actually browse jobs the same way. You know, they'll still mm -hmm. spend those 49 seconds looking at it before they move on. So why are we including these large list of prerequisites, which are just going to discourage people from diverse backgrounds from applying? Like a really interesting one that I find is like for a developer role, if you're going to include the, a computer science degree as a must or even just a need, you're excluding that a large percentage of developers because I think it's like 44% of developers have no academic experience at all. Like up until recently when I trained to be a teacher, I didn't have a degree, but I still managed to do six years of my career before I did that. So yeah, I think stop putting our needs and musts as needs and musts. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Mel. And Ruchi, what are your thoughts? Yeah, like Mel was saying, um, having academic experience isn't necessarily equivalent to someone being competent for the job. And mm. a lot of that associations actually has to do with bias. So bias is actually a really huge barrier for hiring diverse teams. And we may think that um, we don't have bias or that we can use our willpower alone to decrease it but really it's something that's actually part of our brains. So if we want to decrease it, we can't just use willpower alone. We actually have to design systems that help decrease it. And one way to do that is through applied or by focusing on transferable skills. So for example, um, when you ask people questions about their experience, you're actually also gauging their privilege of what they've been able to do. So for example, they might be able to do unpaid internships because of their economic background. So when you ask people questions like that, you might be limiting your pool to people that had opportunities for experiences and then leaving out large groups of people that might've been able to answer the questions well if given the same opportunities. So that's why we suggest asking situational questions so you give everyone the opportunity to show their potential. Yeah, absolutely. This is really interesting what you're both, Mel and Ruchi, what you've, you've talked about from the individual applicant's perspective of how they may assess their own experience and the fact that actually the required skills may not even align with what the job descriptions are asking for. But then Ruchi, you went on to talk about the fact that actually we are excluding through some of these processes whole groups of people based on opportunities they just may not have been afforded prior to that point. Now, Inga, I know you also have something to add on this topic about what barriers we're seeing when it comes to inclusively hiring and specifically in relation to women. Um, yeah, I guess one thing I can add to what Melanie said was that, you know, degrees don't equal competency. I agree. I've actually once hired a, a, a female for a role. She didn't have a university degree and she was absolutely brilliant, um, mm. and, you know, what we hired her for. So agree on that. I think from the operational perspective and kind of HR and operational perspective, one of the barriers that I've experienced at the beginning of the pandemic was actually volume of applications and this ability mm -hmm. 
and kind of a structured way of able to assess candidates fairly, but also effectively mm. and quickly. Um, because, you know, uh, to just to give you an example, we put out um, a role for CEO or head of ops and I received over 600 applications. Um, you know, and, and I think we had the same situation for customer support. It was over 700 applications that myself alone had to kind of sift through and go through. Um, and definitely to, to add, um, not enough women are applying. And that's something I'm experiencing with the current role that I'm, uh, that I'm hiring for, which is a product manager role at a B2B mm -hmm. company. So that's really interesting, Inga. Thank you for giving us that kind of insight from the operational point of view, because sometimes it can seem from the outside that people have lots of suggestions about how things could be done. But when you are actually in the day to day role, it's actually quite challenging. And some of the dynamics you have to navigate aren't easy, quite frankly. So thank you for sharing that particular perspective and offering that view. So. You know, I'll come back then to um, you, Tara, for example. Have you noticed mm -hmm. any of these barriers when hiring for roles? So I think just kind of touching again on, on what everyone said about competencies. So when I, not necessarily when I'm hiring, but when I coach people, and the reason that I, I chose to specialise in career and industry change is that people often are not very good at stringing their story together. So they may have really great transferable skills, but not actually realise or be able to articulate that particularly well. And I think particularly, you know, through the pandemic where people have perhaps been looking for jobs outside of what would be their normal circle, that's even more important than ever because, you know, those competencies are there, those abilities and skills and, and talents, but they don't necessarily know how to articulate them. And if we look at, you know, things like, so I know Cheryl Sandberg talks about this study where, you know, a huge percentage of women will only apply for a job if actually they feel like they've hit 100% of those requirements. Yes. And that, you know, now, particularly when people are at home alone, quite isolated, they also don't have those cheerleaders to, mm. to help them, you know, push themselves forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Tara. And I guess really what that means is let's get into the nitty gritty, right? And I know <laughs> um, <laughs> Inga, um, Mel and Ruchi, you shared some very interesting statistics in our pre-conversations. You know, for example, Inga, um, I know you were talking about the drop off of, you know, women candidates at different stages in the application process. Um, and further to that, um, you know, Mel, you had some interesting um, insights around what you've noticed with regards to barriers in terms of what applied focuses on. Um, yeah, what about the, sorry. Um, <laughs> no problem. So what we're, what we're talking about here is we see a, a drop off of women candidates at certain stages in the application process. And Applied has definitely focused on, um, you know, bringing more women up through the whole process into those roles. Tell us a little bit more about how Applied has focused on that. Yeah, so I think by having these uh, situational questions, we have seen sort of an increase in women that are applying for the roles. So I think the UK, uh, like tech roles specifically, I think the UK average at the moment is 30%, whereas we're getting, uh, I think it's like 45 to 50% across. That's not just in applied itself, but that's, you know, across the app. Um, so all our companies that are using us are seeing that increase. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's definitely something that we've kind of focused on from inception. So our founder, Kate, when she first pitched the idea to the behavioral science team, um, to quote Kate herself, she was armed with a deadly combination of passion for social mobility and wads of research and all the ways the brain gets in the way. Um, so like human bias you know, she, she was aware that human biases would result in this systemic inequality, meaning the hiring system needed to be re redesigned, which is why um, we've kind of seen this increase by doing things slightly different. Mm. I don't know if Wu Ching, you want to add a little bit more onto that? Um, yeah, like Belle was saying, um, it, it's really important to make sure that the whole process uh, tries to decrease bias in the whole recruitment process. So like, for example, the CV um, has tons of bias in it from the person's name to where they went to school to even their previous job titles. Mm -hmm. um, so in an ideal situation, you can do blind assessments. So take the names off those CVs or even in 
another step forward, you would actually not have CVs and you would just do situational questions first. Yes. Because that's more uh, performance based in the long term as well. Yeah, that's really interesting, Riching. And also, I know one of the things that you mentioned was that um, the platform allows candidates the opportunity to show their potential skills, not just their past experiences. Can you touch on that a little bit more? Yeah, so actually when I was introducing myself, I mentioned that I have a background in art and also design and teaching. Um, so I've never been a community leader before, um, but Applied gave me the opportunity to answer situational questions of what a job as a community lead could be like. So I was given the opportunity to think and reflect upon my skills as a teacher or my skills as a designer and how I could use that in this role. And then because of those situational questions, they saw my transferable skills and it gave me this opportunity to move into a different direction that a CV would have just probably canceled me out right away. Yes. Yeah. Those are really powerful points though, right? You know, to be able to move along just another, you know, stage in the process is very significant in terms of driving overall increase in women in, in tech in general. So have you seen, and this is one for the whole panel really, any progress in gender balance in your respective organizations and industries in the last few years? I've definitely seen um, at one of my engagements with a client called Guida, there were there are software, um, so a mentoring software startup. I remember we were looking for a marketing um, manager and we had two finalists, two final candidates, both qualified for the role, a man and a female. And um, our CEO actually made a hiring decision primarily based on gender. Mm. Uh, and that was because he really wanted to balance the team. He wanted to bring gender balance into the team because again, at the time I was the only female, <laughs> as always. And, um, and you know, this trend continued. Um, he later, I think, hired three more or four more and, and reached sort of that 50-50 split. So I really sort of, I've seen kind of, having worked with so many founders now, I really think it does start from the leadership um, and the values that they hold uh, and sort of the organization that they want to build and the team they want to build. So it is possible, but it's sort of, yeah, it has to start from the leadership, I think, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Inga, talking about the benefits there of kind of very intentional inclusive hiring. Anybody else? Yeah, I've, I've had quite a mixed experience. So I'm just going to kind of talk about my experience of being recruited in tech. So I started in tech in um, 2014. Um, and when I was making the last move to Vodafone, so I've been with Vodafone for nearly four years, I have to say, I am incredibly lucky to be at Vodafone because they are very, very female focused. Mm. We, we've just introduced, you know, a, um, a guide to talking about hormonal issues for women in, with menopause and other things like that. So it, they are a really, really forward thinking um, organisation. Mm -hmm. But when I was interviewing to before when I got my job at Vodafone, I actually interviewed with two very large, very well known systems integrators and consultancies in the tech space who you would have heard of, but I won't, I won't name names, no, won't name and shame them. Um, and in both instances, and you'll, I mean, I don't even know what you're gonna think when I say this, I was interviewed as a diversity hire. And both jobs, so I was at the final round, there was me and one other candidate, the hiring manager wanted to hire me, but his manager didn't because he already had one of the old boys in mind that he'd worked with before. And this, mm. this chap was not more qualified than me. You know, it was purely down to the fact that, you know, of this kind of old boys club network. Yeah. So I think it's really still very varied out there. Yeah, absolutely. And you're completely right. It's, it's, it's the follow through sometimes. So that there might be, you know, these ideals that might be shared in company values, maybe even on social media, but the reality of that, you know, the, the actual hiring process says something different. Um, and, and that example you gave Tara is, is extremely apt. Um, and so, you know, one of the comments that we've got here in the chat box function, thank you, Tessa, is um, about the, the real benefit in situational questions in the hiring process, because you're absolutely right, Tessa. 
There are lots of skills and competencies that individuals gain and women specifically gain in parallel or adjacent or maybe even creative, purely creative industries that would allow them to add value to a lot of these tech companies. Um, and so actually asking those situational questions, being open-minded about the background that some of these candidates might have would really help, again, drive, um, you know, female uh, the existence and, and, and the prevalence of women in tech as well. I think that is really important. And, you know, we all know that that is against the backdrop of um, a culture and a system that encourages women to go into certain industries. So it's no wonder that maybe a lot of women who are now thinking about moving into tech come from certain industries. I think we just need to be really aware of that. So thank you so much for that, Tessa. Um, and then also, Ashley, thank you for interacting with us this afternoon. Um, your question with regards to hiring for potential at a close threshold. So what we will do is deal with that one as we um, come along to that. We have a few more questions now, and actually we may even cover that in the next section. Um, Mel, um, did you have anything to add about the increase that you may have seen over the last few years in women in tech? Um, just to sort of Tara's point as well, like it's more from the point of view of me personally interviewing because unfortunately I, um, until I got to apply it, I actually haven't interviewed that many women for developer mm. roles, which is really shocking, isn't it? Um, and like Tara, I have been unfortunately a checkbox offer as well, um, which is, it's, it's patronizing because then you spend your entire time thinking, have I got this job because I have the right skills for the role or do I have this job because they need to check it? to tick a checkbox um which would i think like obviously i work for apply but i think was the really lovely thing about apply because it, i knew that it was all um reviewed anonymously um i knew that they, they didn't have a clue who it was like mm. or you know or anything like that so i know that i've got this role because i can do the job so it's just a different way of looking at it yeah absolutely thank you for sharing that mel um because these are you know really important nuances to to discuss and raise during these conversations so thanks so much for sharing that and it shows there is some progress but we see that that progress is really coming in when hiring managers are intentional maybe even um, are bucking the trend as well that may exist within their company and also exploring their own biases as reaching has really aptly described so far they're willing to think okay why are we doing it this way are we being completely open? What is the value as opposed to just maybe um, dismissing applications um, off, off the bat really as well? Um, so thank you Patron Petronella, beautiful name. We will be covering that actually about how to hire female tech talent in startups because we did actually receive another question that was very similar to that. So we will indeed cover that. So now we're going to go on to talk about the balance, as it were. You know, we've had an Ada's List member um, ask a question. Um, and, you know, they found the process through Applied brilliant. The questions that they were asked were relevant and easy to answer. But they did have an, have an additional question. Okay. How do you make sure written situational questions are not a hurdle to applicants? And how do you make sure that they don't take too much time compared to the standard CV process? Now, one of the things I may ask, um, you know, uh, Ruching and Mel is to explain what a situational question is, first of all, how it's answered. And then, of course, we can start talking about how we balance the time it might take to actually complete that question versus submitting an actual CV. Um, I can jump in on this one. Sure. Um, so like I was mentioning before, um, when I was applying for Applied, I got the opportunity to show my potential. Mm -hmm. So one way that they did that is they knew a big part of my job was to give presentations. So yes. they had me prepare a five minute presentation so they could actually test my competency. Mm -hmm. um, actually that was an in interview process. So that was maybe not the best example. A situational <laughs> question could also be um, like, it's a Friday afternoon and you have only two more hours in the day of, and you still have three more things to do. How mm -hmm. are you going to prioritize them? So you get a chance to see how someone's thinking and how they would do the job. 
And to help deal with the time limits, we would put in recommended like just 250 words so that it's not too burdensome to answer them. Yes. And we would also hope that the um, candidate would realize that this process, although it might take more time than a CV, it's giving them an opportunity that a CV doesn't give them, which yes. is to um, show them how they could actually do the job. And it helps them realize um, what the job will actually entail so that if they yes. do yes. land the job, they'll actually feel confident that they know how to do it because every question was directly related to how the job actually functions. Now this is That's really interesting. Great yeah, go yeah. on, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say that actually, if you think about when you do your CV, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but personally, if I was gonna apply for other jobs now, I wouldn't send the same exact CV to every job. I would try and tailor, you know, what it is I'm emphasizing to, to fit each job role. And actually yes. that can be incredibly time consuming, particularly when you're trying to check off all these boxes, you know, you, you can spend absolutely ages tweaking the wording or slightly emphasizing some numbers or you know so I think actually it could end up being less time consuming and actually easier because you're talking about something you can do instead of trying to demonstrate something that you are yes um, yeah yeah I mean overall CVs in general are actually quite outdated as tools to mm -hmm. apply for roles especially when you look at um, younger generations, millennials, Gen Z, they're not using CVs necessarily um, as maybe previous generations did in order to collate evidence of their work, their skills, their interests. There are other more dynamic and often quite frankly digital um, tools that they are using uh, that replace almost um, the mm -hmm. CV experience. And, and Wuqing, just about your point that you mentioned earlier about CV-less applications, from an employer's perspective, what would the hiring process look like? And I know we've just talked about some of these situational questions that can be used, but what would the hiring process look like without a CV? Because for a lot of employers, they can't even foresee that because that might not have been the way they've been doing things so far. Like how would people actually apply without using a CV? Um, so we try to have the first um, part of the application begin with the job description and the job ad. Yes. So um, you want to make sure you have inclusive language because we know that if you have more masculine leaning language, you're actually might have less women applying for that job. So yeah. it really begins with attracting the candidates with the job description. And then we would say that you need to focus on the core competencies for the job. Yes. And then you need to create a rubric that is going to be the standard for every single applicant so you're not just going on a gut instinct when you have an interview, you're not gonna just say, oh, I like that person, they felt very competent. You're actually gonna know that you're looking for specific skills and that they met those specific skills. So everyone has a fair chance yes. and you're decreasing just having an infinity towards someone because they liked your football team and now you're going to just see them in this positive light the whole interview. Yes. Um, so we try to make, and then we would also recommend having structured interview questions so that everyone has the same questions. There was actually a study that showed that when women v, um, women's founders are going for VC money, that they are often asked questions that are kind of preventative, where men are often given questions that are performance-based. So nice. men are given an opportunity to shine and say like, look what I've done where women have to project into the future and start planning on their toes about the metrics they don't have yet. So it's really important to standardize things, make sure you have common rubrics and you have that throughout the work process. Yeah, so this is really interesting, Richie, what you've said. There's a couple of things that I picked up on. And Ingo, I have a question for you because, you know, first of all, which is what you talked about there about some of the cognitive factors that go through a hiring manager's mind. So you mentioned a great example, maybe casually you've ascertained that they support the same sport team as you. But what that does to our mental consciousness throughout that conversation is make us feel like we relate more to that person, we like them more. And suddenly that kind of 
um, that awareness is creating bias in the process. And we just might not be aware that that is what's happening. I thought that was something so key about what you said and the importance of therefore standardizing the process as much as possible. I kind of want to come to you, Inga, because I know the question was about how time intensive situational questions can be for the applicant. But of course, I imagine that that might present more work for the actual hiring uh, manager, because you know earlier you mentioned about receiving upwards of 500 applications for a role. Um, from an employer's perspective, using a CV-less application process, what impact does that have on your time, for example? Um, I don't know. I, I really like the notion of uh, ditching the CVs because I really think today, you know, you post on all these job boards and people sometimes apply without even reading a job description. They just click apply and they upload their CV and, and you know, people like us on the other end still have to assess and review that CV and screen that CV. So actually, I think getting rid of it altogether and just focusing on situational uh, and maybe like you said maybe performance based or like company value based questions I yes. think might be way 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 better uh, yes it, I feel like it may be more work but for me I, I think quality is always over quantity if I can get 100 applications that you know will put 30 minutes of their time to apply for a role I know they're in for this and they're interested and they've done their research already so I don't know, I, I really like this idea. <laughs> to be honest. Um, I think what you said, Ashanti, about, you know, this bias and kind of like the ability, I've seen this happen so many times and, and founders still do it, you know. Um, I worked with lots of founders very closely and I remember them coming out of interviews saying, oh, but this person's so great, you know, I really like them and this thing, I would go to the pub with them and I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was laughing actually, when you said about the football, because <laughs> so my partner and I both, we met working for the same company. And when I was interviewed, it was a formal interview process with an hour long interrogation, frankly, it wasn't just a presentation. He was interviewed in a pub where they ended up getting absolutely hammered mm. and, you know, messing about in the street with the boss's bike. I mean, and we, that was the same company. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah, this is really interesting say. that you're sharing there, Tara. <laughs> and I think these are the very, these are cultural realities and it takes a lot of self-regulation, self-awareness. And that's why I want to come to you next, Mel, because um, I know you had some comments about some of the advice that Applied gives to employers about how to ensure that using situational questions, going with a CV-less um, application process can also be managed very realistically. So what recommendations do you make uh, to employers who want to use this as a more inclusive way of hiring? Yeah, so this is, um, this is something that actually comes up quite regularly when new customers are coming on board, because yeah, you think, I'm just going to skim through a CV versus questions. I, I get that. But actually, um, what we provide is we have a set of library questions, which you can kind of use from day one, as well as the questions that you make yourself. Um, and we attach to those like um, how well they're designed, which is based on like previous people that have reviewed disagreement rates and candidate scores and the skills tested. So it would have a lower score, for, say, for example, if one reviewer gave it a one, uh, an answer a one. Um, and another gave it a five. Um, and then the other thing we do as well is we recommend that you only actually use three to five work sample questions or situational nice. questions. The reason for that is any fewer and you might miss out on those important details. So Tara was talking about, you know, you tailor your CV to different people. Um, but some of that experience, like my teaching experience actually might be quite useful so having mm -hmm. those three to five questions you would pick out those things those transferable skills um and then any more than that you are raising the barrier so you know let's keep it short yes. but not too short um and then we also encourage you to use the review guides so in terms of the reviewers it might be um like the prioritization question for example that uh, Wuching talked about it might be that you give one star if there's no um they haven't said you know what they're going to prioritize you might give three stars if they've given really good examples of the two things they'll prioritize and you might give five if they've touched every single yeah. um you know every single point um and said 
why you know the, the opportunity costs and things like that but giving those to your reviewers kind of brings back that time a little bit for them yeah now see that's really interesting because it's pragmatic it's also realistic yeah. provided actual resources and tools to employers to support this aim and objective that they have to you know hire more inclusively I suppose you know just rounding it up then you know sometimes you know Tara you shared your experiences Inga you've all shared experiences on applying for roles I would imagine that maybe coming up uh, against situational questions for an application could be new to a lot of women who are applying for these roles. Is there anything in general that Applied does to support the applicants in being able to tackle or address those questions with some confidence? Um, Melanie Luching, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but I, I, I can imagine that for those listening um, who, who may not be used to situational questions, they're wondering, okay, how do I actually, if this has given me a new opportunity to be hired, um, how do I go about, you know, answering these questions? I think what Lila was touching on about how it decreases the number of applicants is true because you're only going to take the time to answer the questions if you read them and you say, oh, I think I can do that. So when I was looking at the job description and the questions for applied, I knew I had never done a community role before, but when I read the questions, I said, I can answer this well. And I know how my transferable skills would give me the ability to be in this situation. So it gives them the opportunity to identify, um, yeah, the transferable skills that they could potentially have. And if the person can't identify transferable skills, then it probably isn't a good fit for them. And then they know to just read the question and then move on to a different job description. Yes. Um, so I think that, yeah, basically, if you can answer the questions well, it means you might be good at the job. And if you can't, maybe don't answer them. And okay. <laughs> I like you. this. They filter themselves out. <laughs> and that's a really useful thing these days, isn't it? <laughs> so few people have got a filter. <laughs> but I, also think it's, I also think it's so important because, you know, as we're going through the pandemic we have lost a lot of jobs and they may not be able to go back to the same jobs they they used to do so being able to really focus on what you know on your current skills not even the past experience like you've mentioned you know because I am now realizing these questions give me give me an example of a time when you did x no one cares. That was three years ago. What can you do now? <laughs> How can you approach a situation now? Mm. You know, I think that's what matters. And um, yeah, after reading your blog, I realized I'm ditching all these questions that I've prepared <laughs> before. <laughs> this, it's not happening anymore. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to thank the panel for coming on. Thank you for sharing those insights. And that was such a brilliant discussion that I'm sure our audience um, also enjoyed. Are there any final thoughts you wanted to share before we move into answering some questions that have come from the audience? I think just on uh, just to follow on um, when it comes to answering the questions, because we are we are actually asked a few times, you know, what would be the perfect answer for this question? Mm. Um, but I think the whole point is there isn't a perfect answer. It's based on your experience where because you're only kind of limited, not experience, sorry, not based on experience, based on your skills. Um, and because you're only limited to 250 words, we're not asking you to do like a huge research project that you need to spend or my bugbear, a huge tech um, task, which takes me a week to do. Um, so it's just kind of, yeah, just answering it as you would just answer the question. You don't need to have that, um, you know, what's my perfect answer going to be? Because everyone's mm. answer is going to be different. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really interesting point, Mel, because we know that perfection is, a, is a, a bit of an issue for women in general. The striving for perfection is an issue within itself. So you're right about that. Anybody else have any thoughts? Um, I do. I would say, you know, I was talking about how difficult it is to have, you know, 600 applications. And, and I can imagine for candidates, it's exactly the same. It's really mm. hard to stand out, right? If you're in the mix of 500 people who are applying for the same role. So what I would say is definitely become more selective when you mm -hmm. are applying, uh, you know, do make a bit of an effort, like in terms of looking through company values, 
reading through their blog, really looking through LinkedIn and their team, you know, who is there um, to kind of really understand whether that's really where you see yourself uh, mm. working. But and then also proactivity. You know, if you want to stand out, I still think sending a LinkedIn request to an HR person or operations person or someone on the team, and then maybe even asking your friend to put a good word for you if they're already connected with someone in the company, literally, it, it makes such a difference because suddenly that candidate went that extra mile mm -hmm. and you can see them evidently a lot quicker. Um, it happened to one of the candidates who applied, a female candidate who applied for a, PM, for a product manager role. And instantly she just popped out. I was like, okay, she's making that extra effort, which mm. I actually really, really appreciate. So I'll yeah. just, that's a couple of tips from my side. No, really helpful. Thank you, Inga, uh, for, that, from, for that perspective. And I think, you know, to kind of expand on what you said there is about also uh, being aware of the, the importance and the value of personal branding and then using tools that will enable you to show who you are and, you know, show um, what, what value you will bring into that process. And then, yes, hopefully you do get noticed by a hiring manager on that basis. Um, really interesting. Anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, just, just to add on to actually what Inga's just said um, in terms of social media, is just to make sure that your shop window is attractive yes. and that it matches with your values and that anything that is publicly available is, matches with, you know, what you say you are about when you're looking for a role. Um, I've seen a lot of people fall foul of that. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. No, thank you for that reminder, Tara, there. So I think a really important question, you know, that follows on quite nicely from this conversation about how to approach the job search process is that, you know, hiring seems to have massively changed due to COVID with much longer interview processes, tasks, and a variety of requirements to get through to the next stage. Now, what I've just mentioned actually came from a question um, from one of our members, and they are currently looking for a job. And to be honest, they've been really transparent and vulnerable in sharing that it has been soul destroying um, when they don't receive feedback or there are long waits in between interviews. Mm -hmm. Now, what advice or tips can you give as a panel collectively um, for those who are trying to stay positive, trying to stay focused throughout the process of job searching right now? Okay, um, so I think with lockdown, um, everything that's going on kind of has a, a way of merging together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all of your emotions, your struggles, your stress and worry, it's you're in the house and you're there all the time. And actually it becomes this big ball of, of panic almost. Um, I think you need to remember to separate out the job hunt and that situation from other things that are going on. Mm -hmm. because otherwise it becomes incredibly overwhelming um, you need to make sure that you keep it in you know, manageable tasks yes. and also review what you can do your skills you know all of these things that we've talked about today really and think about how you will spin that into a positive narrative about what you can do in the future um, and you know there's a lot of help out there for that and then I think also you've just got to remember to do something for yourself every day, even if that is 10 minutes to stare out of a window, get some fresh air, you know, stretch out tired muscles, whatever that might be, but just try and keep that lid on, on what's going on with the job situation, because otherwise it, it just, it floods into everything else and it, it all becomes one big same problem. Yeah, no, thank you very much for sharing that Tara. And I think one of the key things that you've said there is obviously, um, kind of refreshing yourself as an individual, mm -hmm. but also there was something there that you talked about focus and um, trying to maintain that focus and understanding that the job search um, can continue despite or in spite of some of these wider, broader issues that um, the world is experiencing right now. Does anybody else have anything to share about how to stay positive and focused? Um, I can relate a lot to this question because I was also looking for a job really recently during the pandemic as well. Um, and sometimes people don't get back to you months after you've applied for a job and yeah, they don't give you any feedback and that can be challenging because you don't know how to improve or what to change. Um, but one thing that just really helped me mentally was listening to the Atomic Habit book mm -hmm. uh, by James Clearly. And one thing that he said was that it's not about where you are right now 
it's about what you're moving towards. Mm. So he said, even if you don't have that dream job, if you're moving in the right direction, you're actually in a better place than someone that already has something right now, but is moving away from it and is going down a bad path. And keeping that in mind, I think helped calm my, I guess, anxieties around the job search because I knew I was doing everything that I could do, even though I didn't have the outcome I wanted yet. So it helps, it helped me be patient that I was doing all I could do. Yes. Thank you so much for that, Ruchin. Anybody else? Um, just, I think quickly to kind of, you know, iterate on what Tara said, I think I'm a huge advocate of, um, well, not just personal development, but actually um, self-love <laughs> and self-care, especially during the pandemic. And the number of times I said it in so many community uh, meetups, <laughs> you know, I said, do one thing that makes you happy every day. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to prioritize yourself. You are number one priority right now, nothing else. Because if you don't look after yourself, if you don't look and reserve your energy, for things Absolutely. like job seeking, no one else will be there to kind yes. of help you, you know, yeah. especially mm -hmm. if you're stuck at home. So, um, yeah, I think just you've got to put yourself first and that's it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a bit, sorry, go on. Sorry, sorry. And I think one thing as well, if you're not hearing back from a, a, an employer or company that you applied, follow up with them, mm -hmm. ask them, can I please get some feedback? I've had a lot of candidates email me that I've disqualified saying, can I please get some more feedback? Yes, it does take a little bit more time, but I go and actually review the application again and I give them customized feedback. Um, so I, I definitely say, don't be afraid to follow up and say, can I, yeah. I think. And remember as well, that you know, that person may just be a douchebag and it's nothing to do with you. <laughs> you know, that's always something to keep in mind. It keeps me, yeah. my sanity yeah. when everything's going wrong is just to remember maybe they're just not very nice. <laughs> mm, 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 absolutely. So we've had an interesting question that I think would be very good to cover. And it's really about the need or whether or not we should have diverse interview panels when assessing candidates. Are there any recommendations? for creating diverse interview panels, um, especially when this might not be possible. Any thoughts from our panel about how to create a diverse interview panel, especially when there isn't existing diversity within the organization? I think people really need to be able to challenge themselves because, and you know, as I say, starting to think about looking for people who I might want to work with in my own businesses, people are naturally drawn to people that are like them and actually mm. what the reason that old boys club has been able to go on for so long in technology is because that's everybody it's you know the middle class middle-aged white man and actually those are the people and if I look at you know the boards and the management teams of a lot of companies still that's still what we're looking at and I, I think maybe it's not about having the diversity on the panel but it's about realizing that actually you may have to push yourself outside of your comfort zone mm. to achieve a diverse workforce yeah thank you for that tara anybody else in the panel have any thoughts i think you can ask people outside your company as well to come in like i know companies that have done that in the past um and it's, it's a lot better than just asking the one diverse person in your office um just because again <laughs> going against the whole checkbox exercise um, but yeah, bring somebody in from another company, especially when you're a startup. We all want to see each other, you know, succeed. So mm. you know. Mm, that's yeah, I was thinking yeah. about that, um, Mel. Um, thinking maybe shareholders, you know, uh, maybe they will know of someone who might be from Debra's Ask ask anyone or ask your mm. usually founders have really, really great founder networks, uh, like support networks that they always bounce ideas with. Mm. So, um, you know, I think I definitely got interviewed by shareholders and investors many times. They weren't diverse though, <laughs> but I did. So how do you think that would play out though in a, in a multinational? So I've worked for, so in, in my CV, I've worked for GlaxoSmithKline, I've worked for AstraZeneca, um, I've worked for Vodafone and I worked for a computer science company, which is now DXC Technology. And I know for a fact that they would not be able to bring an outsider onto the team. Now you could argue that they should have diversity within that practice already, 
but I mean, how would we challenge that? So that's a really a company? interesting. Like, go on, sorry, Tara. You know, I was just going to say, how would we challenge that within a company? Because I don't think that, you know, it's probably easier in a startup or a smaller company because you hold the reins to it, whereas there's a lot of rules and process involved in corporates where you know you, you perhaps just have to do it the way it's always been done so it's I guess how do we challenge that yeah I mean you raise a very interesting point there Tara sorry did I interrupt somebody oh I was just gonna add on to what Tara was saying if that's okay yeah please do Richie um so what, what Tara was saying before about how everyone should challenge their own affinity biases. Um, there are actually over 180 biases that we have, and it's not just affinity bias. We even have bias from uh, like when we've just been well rested. So like our brain um, takes all of these shortcuts to save time and energy. So it's really important to kind of recognize all of the different biases that we have and then design a system that nudges us away from them because otherwise we're gonna unconsciously fall into all these shortcuts and traps that will just result in a homogenous group of people over and over. Um, so I think that step one is to be educated upon what those biases are, and then one by one, try to create a system that addresses each one of them. Absolutely, mm -hmm. such a good point there, Wu Ching. Um, and I think Tara, you raised some really good points regarding the dynamics of different size organizations and the level of control they may or may not have on an existing process. And I guess this is one of the reasons why, as um, Wuching and Mel um, have talked about the systemic issues that exist. So for a larger organization, their approach might be to start exploring and deconstructing the systems and processes. Whereas for a startup, they're creating them from scratch. They're creating this culture. And actually they can do that very intentionally from the beginning. But in addition to that, if you already lack diversity within your organization, there is the training and education that can be done on existing stakeholders who touch that hiring and talent development process so that they are able to diminish the bias that may exist in those processes and the impact it has on preventing them from inclusively hiring. So there is hope. Um, thank you for that question. Um, it really is about intentional work from organizations if there is a current lack of diversity so you can't have diverse uh, interview panels at the moment. Okay, so we are coming nearly to the end of this afternoon's webinar. It's been fantastic. Some real gems shared here. I just thought we could cover one other question that has come in. So um, a question therefore from Hannah um, around positive discrimination and may even link back to some of our references to a checkbox or tick box activity. So if you have a team of six people, of which five are men, um, and you really need and desire to balance the gender roles in the company, is it possible to positively discriminate and maybe intentionally recruit a woman? What does our panel think? I mean, I can only relate to the example I provided earlier. Um, I would say you know, just discriminating on gender, positive discriminating on gender, um, I wouldn't recommend because you still want to find a candidate that is, 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 you know, is experienced or skillful enough or competent for the role that you're looking for. But um, yeah, from what I've seen in, in some of the experiences, like it has happened where a hiring decision has been made for both, you know, completely qualified candidates where leadership decided to hire a female over, over male. Yeah, yeah I, I, saw, I saw actually the comment from Hugh there about it being illegal in the UK, and yeah, it is, but unfortunately you can't really, you know, legislate for people's thought processes, and I mean, I know for sure that that, that does happen, although actually it's, it should be, and actually the applied thing is really interesting because that would stop that from happening, and um, you would just, you know, get the right person as opposed to picking them on, on any other factors. Any other thoughts? Um, yeah, we, we have found that just from following the applied process, you increase the amount of women that do end up being hired. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily have to hire a woman just because she's a woman. If you design your system to have less bias, you will actually hire more women. Okay. Um, 
and you also need to put a lot of effort into the, um, like I said before, the job description to make sure that every part of your process isn't going to make less women apply. If you're, if the group of people that are in your initial applicant pool uh, have a lot of women in it, then you're more, uh, much more likely to have a woman be your top candidate at the end too. Yeah, absolutely. And it was a bit of a trick question because I already knew uh, that there would be discussion around positive discrimination. Don't worry, Hannah, thank you for your question. I understood that you didn't mean purely discriminate solely on the basis of gender, but it's always a really interesting discussion point about how intentional and strategic an organisation can be through tools like Applied that will mean that the outcome is that more diverse candidates, and in this specific case, women, come through those pipelines. So this has been a really brilliant discussion. That's all we have time for today in this webinar. We hope you enjoyed it and took away some very tangible and practical points that you can use in your hiring process. Um, do reach out to the team at Applied. They're doing some brilliant work in the sector. And we will be following up with you with an email with a roundup of some of these questions and the topics that we've covered today. So from us as a panel to you, have a fabulous day. Thank you. If it would be possible, um, also we're actually, I'm gonna be hosting a webinar tomorrow about biases. So yes. if anybody wants to um, join that, um, it's on um, our website if people wanna just learn more about how to uh, decrease biases in their recruitment process. Brilliant, thank you. Oh, great, thanks. We're also recruiting. <laughs> I'm also recruiting for product manager roles. So if anyone anyone knows, I would love to recruit a female actually for that role because it is a very male, you know, sort of base role. But um, yeah. Absolutely. So what we could do maybe is if we um, correlate some of that or aggregate that information for the roundup email that could be sent to everyone who attended today, mm -hmm. that would be really useful. Lovely. Thank you very much, Ashanti. No worries.